We are checking out Cougar's booth and they've got a couple of interesting products among all the other things they have that I wanted to stop and take a look at. First off, the 450K. Um, this one is really interesting, first off, because it's splash proof. And I know a lot of you guys are just sitting there at your desk with your beer, sitting right on top of your keyboard and you knock it over and you're done. Well, this one's splash proof and uh, they have an interesting thing going on here. It's not a Cherry MX switch. Uh, it's not a switch I've ever seen before. It feels kind of like a Topra. It's a hybrid switch. There's a membrane and a housing. And the housing creates a, a perfect seal so that none of the water is going to get on the inside. It's kind of poppy. To me, it actually felt like a, um, a softer version of the Topra switch, but a little bit poppier even than that because it's softer. You push it down, it takes less actuation force, and then it pops back up. So that's, that's a pretty interesting keyboard. We also have uh, you know the, the four programmable keys, uh, media keys, and you can do the polling all the way up to 1,000 uh, hertz. You can change your polling right here on top. And other than that, it's a pretty standard gaming keyboard, slightly less aggressive as far as the looks go compared to their other, like their 700K and their and that sort of thing. Then they also have the 400K, which is a slight step down. This one's, this one's fully LED, so it's, it's splash proof, and you have LEDs, uh, not RGB, just, just a few different colors, but you do have that here. You can step down a little bit, and save some money and go with one without the LEDs. You still get the, you know, the same switch. Which I think I think the switch is kind of interesting. You'd have to try it, but if you like Topras, you may end up liking this switch. The other thing is they're bringing this in at a very low price point, like around sixty nine seventy U.S. dollars. So it's, it's that's pretty cool. Uh, it feels better than to me than a membrane. Let's go check out their ITX rig that won an award right now. Uh, this is the QBX. This uh, is a nice somewhat small ITX case, but you can put a lot in here. First off, graphics card, 350 millimeters. You can also put a 120 millimeter radiator or a 240 if you're only using one fan in here. So lots of room for activity. So let's go ahead and tell you the actual size. 178 by 260 by 368 millimeters. And uh, you can fit four SSDs or five hard drives in total in here if you want to use a regular hard drive. I imagine you could also swap out the last hard drive and put an extra SSD in there. And there's going to be some spots on the bottom where you might be able to, you know, Velcro or tape SSDs as well, because SSDs, no moving parts. You don't have to screw them down unless you don't want to. All right, we got a couple, a couple demo units here. Once you take off the side panel, both the side panels are mesh on these, which, you know, it will produce a little bit of noise. You have noisy components. There you see the hard drive in there. Um, power supply actually mounts in the front up here, and it's designed so that the air is going to be sucked in from the, the, the back side over here, and then See this little area up here on the top? It's going to be exhausted out through here and come out that way. Huge graphics cards can go in here up to 350 millimeters. That's pretty freaking ridiculous. Um, I guess there's not much else to say about this until we can fully take it apart. You can fit a slim optical disk drive uh, right up on top here in the front. The CPU is going to go under here, mounts right under there. Not too bad. We also have this model here. So if the plastic brushed aluminum look is not your thing, you can just go for the, the pure on, you know, vents and grills everywhere look. I am a bit worried about the dust that this one's going to pick up, but it does have a pretty unique design. And back here you can see there's ventilation for the components. Uh, so I don't think that this one's going to get too hot. There's room for plenty of fans. So you can mount several fans in here. There's room up top for fans, room in the front for fans, room on the sides for fans. There's a bracket that has a fan installed on top of it. So lots of room for fans. You can kind of play around and find the airflow that's going to be right for you. So anyway, that's the uh, Cougars ITX offering here at uh, Computex. This is the Attack X3. I know you guys have seen the 600K, the 500K, and the 700K. This one is a, it's sort of like the slimmed down, you don't need anything other than a decent keyboard version with just aluminum, none of the extra you know, pads, none of the extra M keys, just a simple keyboard. There it is. And the price on this is gonna be around the 120, 130 uh, US dollar range. And these are Cherry MX keys with full backlight, you know, the M key rollover, everything. We looked at DFI last year and we looked at a lot of their H-Series expand, expandable options, uh, sort of little daughter boards. Now they've kind of taken an interesting path as far as expandability goes and backwards compatibility. This is Skylake, but when you look at this, you're not going to think Skylake. You're going to think, oh, that's some old motherboard I found. Because look at all the, all the PCI uh, you know, ports, but we've got USB 3 and, and we've got the latest SATA. Only got two RAM slots on there, but these are very specialized motherboards. I see RS-232. Um, maybe quite a bit of RS-232 connect, uh, connectivity, I'm not really sure. But these are these are obviously aimed at more sort of industrial and legacy support type applications. You know, you've got two RAM slots. The other version, uh, the H81 version, looks like it's even got solderable RAM 
as an option. That's that's not Skylake, obviously, because it's H81, but right. uh, fourth gen core processor or whatever for that. But it's sort of an interesting take. The other thing that's really interesting is the sort of is the uh, the Internet of Things uh, sort of version, and we're we're seeing a lot of ITX hardware. So we've got three boards here that are interesting. The, the AMD R series Mini ITX, this is a second gen embedded R series processor from AMD. So it's dual channel DDR3 uh, SODIMs up to 16 gigs. You've got four DisplayPort, two gigabit Ethernet, four COM ports, nine USB, one PCIe by 16 and one Mini PCIe. Then you've got the uh, Skylake Mini ITX. It's all soldered, of course, but you get the DDR3L, two SODIMs up to 16 gig, one HDMI, one DisplayPort one LVDS for an internal LCD, two gigabit Ethernet, four COM, eight USB, then you've got one PCIe by four, one mini PCIe, and then uh, LPC to extend uh, up to four serial ports. And then finally, you've got the uh, Intel Pentium Celeron, which is soldered right on board. This is the Braswell. Um, this is a uh, dual channel DDR3L, two sodium, up to eight gigs, one VGA, one display port, one LVDS. So it's, it's a very compact configuration, but you know, we're not, we're seeing it on, you know, sort of the ITX standard. Notice that Except for the Intel, or except for the uh, AMD R series, the two Intel platforms are going straight DC. So they're eschewing the standard ATX connector, which is you know a huge number of of, of different voltages. You go 3.3 volts and 5 volts, etc., for just straight up DC inputs, which of course simplifies the board layout and of course simplifies the uh, power delivery circuitry and that kind of thing. So it, we're really seeing a dramatic reduction in in uh, in terms of you know board space required to do amazing things. This is really for people who want to do something, you know, industrial, something a little different, but, you know, move up to latest platform, get, take advantage of that, while also being able to take advantage of tiny form factor, and the DC uh, is going to be nice as well. Yeah, these are great for embedded systems where you're going to build an appliance, but you want it, you know, with x86 with a little bit of horsepower. Okay, we stopped in to see our friends at Plexter. I wanted to see what they were up to. We're waiting on the M7E to come out. We're taking a look at a system that's got the M6E Pro. It's the M6E, but it's been updated to have a little bling. So it's it's the M6E that you guys all know and love, should should know and love from our reviews. But it's blinged out a little bit, which is good, because that's something we told them to do. The M7E is going to come out, and it's going to be insanely way fast. But wait. What's this? They've got a benchmark. They're showing this, the M6E, at 8 gigabytes per second read and 7.8 gigabytes per second write. So we stopped by to talk to them about what exactly they're doing. And it turns out that in about a month, they're going to release some software for Plexter SSDs that'll work with the M6 Pro. It's a SATA version of this. And the M6E, which is the PCI Express or the M.2 version that you guys have seen on our channel. The software on this that's doing this is called Plex Turbo. It's kind of like a RAM disk, but it's not really a RAM disk at all. What they're doing is a little more intelligent. They're actually looking at what's on the disk and what happens in a, in a file write operation, and they're only writing to the SSD what has changed. So let's say that you, uh, you know, you're downloading a patch for a game and it's several gigabytes, and you know, it's got to update data files that are multiple gigabytes in size. Instead of updating the whole file, the uh, write operation, the software will look at what is to be written to disk and what is already on disk, and will actually only write the parts that have changed. And so effectively, the system will say, oh, I've got this you know, five gigabyte file I've got to write out, which is you know, your, your data file with your textures or whatever, but the patch might only modify you know, a few hundred megs of that. This way, only the few hundred megs is actually written to disk. And so you get crazy numbers from your benchmark software because it's like, oh, I'm writing a benchmark file that's the same as the last benchmark file. So yeah, it's already here. It's already the same. So I don't actually need to write it to disk. And so you get these absurd numbers. Uh, the other thing that they've got is Plex Compressor, which is a, a kind of compression software that runs in the background on Plexer disks. Uh, you know, Windows has built-in comp compression software, but this is a little different in that it, it's running in the background and it's only compressing files that haven't been used in, in a month or so. It, you take a little bit of a CPU hit when, when that happens, but it doesn't affect the performance of the drive. The, the performance of the drive in terms of read and write sp speed is basically the same because it happens asynchronously. The last feature is Plex Vault. Plex Vault actually lets you create a disk that's hidden. So when we started, we only had C and D. Now we have E, we hit a, we hit a disk. This isn't I encryption software or anything like that, but it lets you create a hidden disk that has hidden files that only shows up when you hit a certain hotkey. And you can map more than one drive per hotkey. 
we've got another drive that has a different hotkey, and so now my disk O2 is showing up, which contains different files. So this is maybe useful if a bunch of different people use a computer, and you need to be able to hide and show drive letters based on a hotkey. I mean, I can think of one use for that immediately, but uh, there's probably better uses than that one. Yeah, divorce is easier. <laughs> All right, that's been a quick look at the, what's going on with Plexer. I'm really looking forward to the software. I really really want to play with the software and take it for a spin and see if it sort of lives up to the hype that's here. Um, we've messed around with RAM disk software before. I haven't really been impressed with RAM disk software, but messing around with it on the uh, test machine, it seems a lot more intelligent than normal RAM disk software. And for systems that have 16, 32 gigabytes of RAM, being able to leverage that RAM in this way for ludicrous read and write speeds, I need that.